Good morning 8x3 and welcome back. I hope you've had a good half term. Uh, I hope you feel a bit more rested and relaxed and that you've had a healthy and safe time. So we're back at school now and we are going to pick up where we left off. Now you've probably heard some uh, information or details about the return to school. Uh, I don't want to comment on that uh, in that that'll be coming from the head teacher. But I do look forward to a day in the nearish future when we're all back in the classroom together. For now, we are going to return to our study of Oliver Twist. We're looking to hopefully finish it by the end of this half term, if not earlier than that. So let's carry on to the next chapter and the next bit of work we're going to do. Here we go. Following our work at the end of last half term, where we were reading about uh, Oliver and his encounter with the Artful Dodger, and then meeting uh, Fagin, who runs the um, gang of pickpockets, we're now going to carry on into a chapter that's looking a little bit at that life about pickpocketing. Uh, before you, we begin that, though, can you please answer the first question here? What has been harsh about Oliver Twist's life so far? Uh, two or three bullet points trying to pull out what you can remember from the uh, the previous chapters. What has been difficult about his life? Uh, an obvious early one to begin with might be uh, his life in the workhouse. Try and pick out one detail from there. Being underfed, for example. And then if you just skim through the previous work we've done, can you pick out two or three more bullet points? Uh, things that have been harsh about Oliver's twist life so far. And then... Let's begin our reading. Soon, the Dodger returned, accompanied by a very sprightly young friend who was now formally introduced to him as Charlie Bates. Well, said the Jew, glancing slyly at Oliver and addressing himself to the Dodger, I hope you've been at work this morning, my dears. Hard, replied the Dodger. As nails, added Charlie Bates. Good boys, good boys, said the Jew. What have you got, Dodge? A couple of pocketbooks, replied the young gentleman. What have you got, my dear? said Fagin to Charlie Bates. Wipes, replied Charlie Bates, at the same time producing four pocket handkerchiefs. After Charlie and the Dodger left, Fagin turned once more to Oliver. There, my dear, said Fagin. That's a pleasant life, isn't it? They've gone out for the day. Have they done work, sir? inquired Oliver. Yes, said the Jew. Make them your models, my dear. Make them your models. Do everything they bid you and take their advice in all matters, especially the Dodgers, my dear. He'll be a great man himself and will make you one too, if you take pattern by him. Is my handkerchief hanging out of my pocket, my dear? said the Jew, stopping short. Yes, sir, said Oliver. See if you can take it out without my feeling it, as you saw them do when we were at play this morning. Oliver held up the bottom of the pocket with one hand as he had seen the Dodger hold it, and drew the handkerchief slightly out of it with the other. Is it gone? cried the Jew. Here it is, sir, said Oliver, showing it in his hand. You're a clever boy, my dear, said the playful old gentleman, patting Oliver on the head approvingly. I never saw a sharper lad. Here's a shilling for you. If you go on in this way, you'll be the greatest man of the time. And I'll come here and I'll show you how to take the marks out of the handkerchiefs. Oliver wondered what picking the old gentleman's pocket in play had to do with his chances of being a great man. But, thinking that the Jew, being so much his senior, must know best, he followed him quietly to the table and was soon deeply involved in his new study. So that brings us to the end of chapter four, which is what we were reading before the half-term break. And his, well, I suppose, the beginning of Oliver's training with Fagin. Now, if it hasn't been clear, Fagin is a complicated character. On the one hand, he is training these boys to be thieves, to be pickpockets, to go out into the London crowds and steal from anyone they can and bring it back to him. And they do this through often handkerchiefs, pulling them out of people's pockets and whatever might be wrapped up inside of them. And there's other work going on on the side. So that's obviously bad. He's training these young people to be thieves and he's exploiting them for his own gain. At the same time, 
Fagin does seem to genuinely care for the young people he's in charge of. He gives them a home. He gives them food. If these children weren't with him, they'd be out on the streets, starving, dying, uh, or being forced to live in some pretty horrible circumstances. So Dickens presents Fagin as a complicated character. He refers to him as a Jew again and again and again, and he really emphasizes this aspect of the character, of his religion. This is a time of anti-Semitism. Uh, unfortunately, today is still a time of anti-Semitism, uh, which is uh, a dislike, uh, a hatred, um, stereotyping of Jewish people. So why does Dickens keep referring to Fagin as a Jew? I think he is playing off of his readers' own assumptions about what a Jewish person might be like and the horrible stereotypes they might have, the prejudices they might have. And he's challenging that a bit. On the one hand, yes, he is doing some bad things. On the other hand, he is, or you'll see he ends up being one of the most genuine and in some ways good characters of this novel. We're now going to begin chapter five, which will be a bit more about this idea of pickpocketing. Okay, please follow along with your own text. For many days, Oliver remained in the Jew's room, picking the marks out of the pocket handkerchiefs, of which a great number were brought home, and sometimes taking part in the game already described. Whenever the Dodger or Charlie Bates came home at night, empty-handed, Fagin would curse with great violence about the misery of idle and lazy habits, and would enforce upon them the necessity of an active life by sending them supperless to bed. But Oliver still wanted to join his new friends. One morning, Oliver obtained the permission he had so eagerly sought. He placed him under the joint guardianship of Charlie Bates and his friend, the Artful Dodger. The three boys sallied out, the Dodger with his coat sleeves tucked up and his hat cocked, as usual, Charlie Bates sauntering along with his hands in his pockets, and Oliver between them, wondering where they were going. They were just emerging from a narrow court not far from the open square in Clickenwell, when the Dodger made a sudden stop, and laying his finger on his lip, drew his companions back again, with the greatest caution and circumspection. What's the matter? demanded Oliver. Hush! replied the Dodger. Do you see that old cove at the bookstall? The old gentleman over the way, said Oliver. Yes, I see him. He'll do, said the Dodger. Oliver looked from one to the other with the greatest surprise, but he was not permitted to make any inquiries, for the two boys walked stealthily across the road and slunk close behind the old gentleman towards whom his attention had been directed. Oliver walked a few paces after them, and, not knowing whether to advance or retire, stood looking on in silent amazement. The old gentleman was a very respectable looking person with a great coat and gold spectacles. What was Oliver's horror and alarm as he stood a few paces off, looking on with his eyelids as wide open as they would possibly go to see the Dodger plunge his hand to the old gentleman's pocket and draw from there a handkerchief. It's worth noting here Oliver's surprise at what's just happened. He's described as Oliver's horror and alarm with his eyelids wide open. And he's genuinely shocked to see the Artful Dodger steal to pickpocket the old gentleman's handkerchief. Which shows you something about the innocence of the character of Oliver. Up to this point, he genuinely seemed to have thought this was some kind of a game that Fagin was teaching them, uh, a kind of like party trick. And hadn't made the connection that what they were really being trained to do was to go and steal from people, uh, preferably rich people. Now, Oliver sees this old gentleman as respectable looking. He thinks that this old man seems like a nice person. And so he's shocked and horrified that the Artful Dodger is stealing from him. Let's see what happens next. In an instant, the whole mystery of the handkerchiefs and the watches and the jewels and the Jew rushed upon the boy's mind. He stood for a moment with the blood so tingling through all his veins from terror that he felt as if he were in a burning fire. 
Then, confused and frightened, he took to his heels, and, not knowing what he did, made off as fast as he could lay his feet to the ground. This was all done in a minute's space. In the very instant when Oliver began to run, the old gentleman, putting his hand to his pocket and missing his handkerchief, turned sharp around. Seeing the boy scudding away at such a rapid pace, he very naturally concluded him to be the taker, and shouting, Stop, thief! with all his might, made off after him, book in hand. But the man was not the only person to make this cry. Charlie Bates and his friend Dodger, being the good citizens that they are, cried, Stop, thief! too. You can see the difference between Oliver and Charlie Bates and the Artful Dodger here as well. The other two boys are practiced criminals. They stole from the man. Best thing to do to look innocent is to not draw attention to yourself. They just stand there. Oliver, running away, is the one that gets spotted and accused uh, and is chased after. Charlie Bates and the Artful Dodger to fit in call Stop Thief at, after Oliver Twist as well, which is a kind of betrayal, I think uh, you can see it as. If you're paying attention, you might also notice that the gentleman himself has accidentally stolen the book. So uh, is he that different from, all, from, from the others in a way? Well, he is because it was an accidental theft. Um, finally, one thing to really try and pick up on Dickens is that his language is full of humour and full of irony and sarcasm. When he writes in that last sentence, Charlie Bates and his friend Dodger, being the good citizens that they are, cried stop thief too. It's obviously meant to be a bit funny. They're not good citizens. They're the actual thieves. So there's a humour in them calling out stop thief. It's a dark humour because obviously it's going to get Oliver into a lot of trouble. Uh, but Dickens is having a bit of fun there. So that's an example of irony or ironic uh, language. Stopped at last. A clever blow. He is down upon the pavement and the crowd eagerly gather around him each newcomer jostling and struggling with the others to catch a glimpse. Make room there for the gentleman. Is this the boy, sir? Oliver lay, covered with mud and dust and bleeding from the mouth, looking wildly around upon the heap of faces that surrounded him, when the old gentleman was officiously dragged and pushed into the circle by the foremost of the pursuers. Yes, said the gentleman. I am afraid it is the boy. A policeman made his way through the crowd and seized Oliver by the collar. Come, get up, said the man, roughly. It wasn't me, indeed, sir. Indeed, indeed, it was the two other boys, said Oliver, clasping his hands passionately and looking round. They're here somewhere. Oh, no, they ain't, said the officer. The Dodger and Charlie Bates had filed off down the first convenient alley they came to. Come on, get up. Don't hurt him, said the old gentleman, compassionately. Oh, no, I won't hurt him, replied the, uh, the officer. Oliver, who could hardly stand, made a shift to raise himself on his feet, and was at once lugged along the streets by the jacket collar at a rapid pace. The gentleman walked on with him by the officer's side, and as many of the crowd as could achieve the feat got a little ahead and stared back at Oliver from time to time. The boys shouted in triumph, and on they went. And so there ends Oliver's first... Uh, well, I wouldn't say attempt at pickpocketing because he didn't do any pickpocketing, but he's the one who got caught. So in a way, he remains innocent, but he is tainted by his association with the other two thieves. Now, the outcome of today's lesson is going to be for you to write a paragraph about an aspect of the language that uh, Dickens is using in writing this chapter. And so we're developing what in this PowerPoint is called a, a P-E-Z-Z, -Z, a PEZ paragraph. Other subjects will call it different things. You might have heard it called a PQCD uh, or a PEE -E or a PEAD. It doesn't matter, okay? It's all roughly the same thing. What you're going to try and do is write about what we've just read. So a good paragraph, uh, a good outcome from this lesson will be for you to write something that includes the four points you see on the screen here. That first, you're going to answer the question in your opening sentence. You're going to explain uh, what it is you're doing. 
Then you can insert some evidence, a quote from the text. Now here it's calling it zoom in, other people would call it explain or develop. And this is where you're going to analyze the quote. Now that's often a bit confusing. What does it actually mean to analyze? Well, in this case, it means really focusing on a single word or two, okay, a short phrase, and try to explain or make sense of why that language was used, okay? Uh, so for example, in the reading, I mentioned an example of irony when uh, the Artful Dodger uh, and Mr. Bates are called um, good citizens. Well, you look at that word good and citizen and you try to explain why is that irony? Okay, how does that work to mean the opposite of what's really happening? And from there, you might step back. That's the zoom out. That's the develop where you're trying to Put everything you've written into a larger context right so you're looking at how these boys are thieves and maybe dickens is saying something about the life for young people uh, on the streets at that time so here is an example to practice with how does dickens use language to portray the harsh reality of oliver's life okay so the point might be dickens shows the harsh reality of oliver's life when he's accused of pickpocketing the evidence this is shown in the blood so tingling through all veins from terror that he felt as if he were in a burning fire. So there's a point, there's some evidence, and then for the next two parts, he would focus on those specific words. Tingling, terror, the simile, or rather the metaphor, what else is simile? As if. So the simile, he were in a burning fire. Right? How does that show the effect of the reality of pickpocketing on Oliver? Okay, so have a go at practicing that paragraph. Once you've done that, you'll do it again, but this time writing about irony. So this is the one I've already spoken about, right? So the good citizens, the stop thief, uh, the irony there, um, and the, the sort of hypocrisy of what they're doing. Now, if you're still a little bit confused about irony or how it works here, some examples visual examples i suppose uh, of what it's talking about so for example um, a fitness place that uses an escalator instead of stairs i mean again i'm not convinced that this isn't 100 percent irony because of course the escalator could be there for a very good reason for those who might have um, uh, issues with mobility right you can still be fit without having to work out your legs but you get the idea here that it's trying to show a contrast uh, you've also got, uh, I'll leave you to read this yourself, the different types of irony. But you can see here, uh, you know, this is a Pepsi van and the guy's drinking Coke. I mean, it's not really irony. This is much more of an example of, um, I guess you could say like betrayal or hypocrisy. But even then, you get the idea, though, that it's about trying to set up a contrast between two things. Uh, here you've got the... McDonald's underneath the uh, advert for childhood obesity. And here you've got the safe driving school and you've got the van that's crashed into it. And you've got this one, which I believe is more recent, get a brain morans misspelt. Uh, of course, you always have to be careful with these kind of things because often people get in there and they do a little bit of digital editing to make a point. And he may in fact have written it correctly the first time. But again, the point is there. Uh, that kind of contrast between telling someone to be clever, but then not being clever yourself, right? So the irony there is meant to be in that contrast. And so that brings us to the end of the lesson and the main task for you to work on, which is to complete two PEZZ paragraphs, basically two paragraphs of writing, answering the question, how does Dickens use language to portray the harsh reality of Oliver's life? Okay, using what you see in chapter five. You've got uh, the example here, the quotation, Charlie Bates and his friend Dodger, being the good citizens that they are, cried stop thief too. And you can use that example to write about. And you got the one, the blood so tingling through all veins from terror that he felt as if he were in a burning fire. Now this slide, this question is asking you to use these two specific quotes, but if you're feeling adventurous, uh, I invite you to look into the text and try and find another example that you might use to write about the harshness of life
for Oliver uh, on the streets with the pickpocketing and so on. Good luck. I look forward to seeing your answers. And I'll see you next week. So that's it for today, 8x3. As always, uh, keep healthy, keep safe, and I'll see you next lesson. Goodbye.